So it's all just kind of hitting me right now all at once that not only am I going to be making a series of videos about the thing that I'm making, but I'm also going to be live streaming the entire process. And that's a little terrifying. <laughs> My name is Ben Burns. I'm a designer, creative director, and father of the year. Five years running. I'm on a journey to rethink, revamp, and redesign my personal website. It's the only project that I've never finished. It's time to get this built. Welcome to Built by Hand. Last time, I plotted out how to organize my website. I drew up a site map and a set of wireframes that will help guide me through the design process. I have a plan and I'm excited to start transforming these basic sketches into something cool. In this episode, my mission is to dig into some creative research and find reference materials that'll help me set the visual direction for the site. In short, I need to find design inspiration for this project. Oh. Hello there. I was just waiting for you to like the video. We're on a mission to help a billion people make money and, and earn a living. Oh, I screwed that one up. We're on a mission to help a billion people make a living doing what they love. And every single like helps this video reach more people. So do me a favor, head below the video while my chimes go off and ruin the cut and hit the like button. Do it. Do it. Do it. All right. Finding references and doing creative research is usually my favorite part of the whole design process. Honestly, if I had the time, I could scroll through Pinterest all day. I love it. Now, normally when we work with clients, research is part of our discovery process. This process looks something like this. First, we walk them through a few exercises that help them describe the look that they're after. And then we group together the words that they use to explain their desired look and feel and identify patterns. Then we use those patterns to find visual references that fit the brief. Finally, we bring everything together into stylescapes that really communicate the direction that we wanna go. Now I've noticed something. Throughout the discovery process, there's a give and take. The client says something and then it bounces around in our brain. And then we find references that seem to match our interpretation of what they're looking for but every time there's a little bit that's lost in translation. Our perspective influences the outcome, even if we don't mean to. And it's not intentional, it's, it's serendipity. That game of telephone with the client is really where the magic happens. I love that process. And I'm a wizard at that phase. But that presents a problem for me. So how do I even do this without a client? Without the back and forth, will this process that I've refined over the last decade actually work? And beyond that, whenever I've created for myself in the past, I come up empty. It's the very reason why I've never finished this project. It's easier for me to work with clients. I'm better at creating from an empathetic position. So how on earth do I pick this stuff for myself? If the site is supposed to represent who I am, my brand, me, how do I even make those decisions? If I can't have an outside perspective on my own projects, you know, if I can't see the forest or the trees, I need some help. I need to go get it from somewhere else. So I wanted to see how other designers went about their research process and where better to start than one of my design heroes? Hey, I'm Hervoy Grubišić, uh, design director from Croatia. Hervoy is too modest. He's an incredible designer whose work is a blend of old and new. You know, the websites that he designs, they use typography and layout that's totally the opposite of what's trending in the UI world. And I wanted to get to the bottom of where he finds his inspiration. What I really want to talk to you about, like selfishly, is the design process. Mm -hmm. and um, kind of understanding the way that you approach your projects and the way that you approach like a new kind of design pro project. So let's start with research. What do you look for? What, what sites do you visit? Like, do you do romantic things like go to art museums and so, like, where, where do you pull your assets and, and research in the beginning of a project? It, it really depends 
on the project. So basically what I usually do, I, I do a lot of research every day. It's not project related. I just want to do research and educate myself and trying to I- explore as much as possible. So you talked about like a process where you're, you could get overwhelmed by all the visual noise. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm just trying to move away from um, some, I would say, basic platforms for inspiration. I inspire a lot uh, on the Tumblr also because you can find a lot of nice uh, profiles with uh, really nice collections of print design. So basically, I would say uh, Tumblr is a really good place for graphic design. As Ervoye and I talked about research and finding inspiration, he mentioned a project that he's working on that I, I just got really excited about. A few days ago, I was thinking about that collections and I came up with idea. I already started working on it. I will do some kind of uh, base of typography that I will bring online uh, to the community where I'll be, I will put all of my collections there and I will classify them by the... Let's say, okay, these are good alternatives to Helvetica. These are good alternatives oh, to... Oh, that's G- crazy yeah. cool. I love that. Yeah, it can be super helpful. Uh, I want to present it in a dead way to make it easier uh, to people uh, to find something that they're looking for. Yeah. Because most of the times people are, are searching for some fonts and cannot find something because there's a not there's not a good place where you can find oh let's try to find something similar to something mm-hmm. else so i want to make it easier for uh people to find something to inspire once uh, once research is done and it sounds like you do you do research pretty much all the time and, and you just have these kind of archives at the ready what's the next step for you next step is to create a really good mood board uh for a client where I explore a lot of different styles and getting them in some kind of context. I explore different uh, feelings. Okay, let's try to represent some kind of uh, theme or something Mm -hmm. from typography, from colors to layout, everything. Real quick, future Ben here. What's the difference between a mood board and a stylescape? It's a great question get it all the time. A mood board is a collection of images put on a board that helps you set the visual direction for a project. Now, a stylescape is the same thing. The biggest difference is that everything is curated and edited into a composition that the entire stylescape looks like one thing instead of a collection of things. And it makes it very easy to communicate a vision to your clients. And I can tell you, whenever there's a client involved, I will be creating stylescapes every single time. But since there's no client here, since this is just for me, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to stick with mood boards because I can see the patterns. I know what I'm looking at. I can interpret things from the mood boards. I love what Hervoye said about moving outside of these typical platforms for inspiration. And, And that's actually one of my favorite things to do while traveling. You know, taking pictures of little bits and pieces of typography and iconography and signage. You'd be amazed what you can find just by walking downtown for a few minutes. If you're looking. (laughs) I gotta be honest. I, I wish I could get out more. I wish that things were different. And I'm getting out like doors. Like (laughs) I'm in nature a lot more, which is fantastic. I'm getting more exercise nowadays than I ever was. But the thing is, is that like, I wish I could just go to a museum or a library and check out some books or some other pieces of art. I want to go to places where other people's work lives so that I can just be inspired. And unfortunately right now, you just can't do that. I realized after talking to Ervoye that designers at his caliber really make research a habit. It's not something that they use as part of a process. It's not a mission that they go on at the beginning of a project. It's something that they do all the time. They're out there collecting and curating things pretty much all day. And the the great thing about that is that when when it comes time to pull references from an actual project, they just go back into their archives and make a withdrawal. Now, this is something I need to get better at. Forming a habit of constant study, constant inspiration gathering, that would be incredible. But today, (laughs) well, today I'm starting from square one and I'm just gonna follow my process. 
All right, I think, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work out how I would want to describe the look and feel of the site and also my brand overall. The more I brainstormed on the list, the patterns became clearer. I love the contradiction that we have here. We have two concepts that seemingly clash, but they actually work well together if you really think about it in the right context. Something that's humble, but still confident. Something that's sophisticated without being standoffish. Something that's like got a little grit to it or a little rough around the edges, but still capable of beauty. I think there's something here and I think I'm ready to start pulling reference material. One thing that I've done for a really long time is what I call micro research. Now this is a simple strategy. If your finished design is the, is the main dish, you research each individual ingredient by themselves. So rather than trying to find an entire website that's inspirational, you know, you're breaking this stuff down into bits and pieces and looking at all those parts individually. And what this does is it helps me prevent the temptation to simply copy somebody else's design. So for this site, I decided to research seven design ingredients, several categories. One, grid and layout. Two, typography. Three, navigation. Four, color. Five, link button and form field styling. Six, imagery. And finally, seven, interactions and animations. Now the majority of these categories were pretty easy to source. Going into the project, I knew that I wanted a full screen menu, you know, something that opened up and covered the entire site. I also knew that I wanted a subdued color palette and I've been leaning towards this like hunter green recently as my primary color. For most of the interactive stuff like link and button and field styling, I honestly, it was pretty easy to find some really cool stuff. Ooh, that's cool. Oh, the arrow just shows up. Let's take a screenshot of that. You see, I'm making myself little notes here and I'm noting animations, but I'm not being super specific with what they do because that's, that's the sandbox that we can play in. But just the idea of like an arrow showing up that wasn't there before and an underline animating can spark some, some interesting ideas down the road. The bulk of my time was spent doing a lot of digging into two categories, layout and typography. On the layout side, I started by digging into a few of my favorite websites, bookmarks that I had collected over time. I loved how some of these sites were able to use the entire browser window without having to clutter up all the space with something. You know, I also loved where the typography took the lead and the images weren't f like forced to carry the website. Oh, this is cool. This is beautiful. So when I see something like this, I'm like, the type is perfect. It's got tons of negative space behind it. And then also the color. I really like the kind of dark green here with the pink. I also hate banded designs, you know, those site with like full width bands. So I was delighted to find sites that just kind of broke that mold of the typical 12 column grid. If you're not sure of what a 12 column grid is, think about it this way. You take the width of your canvas, in this case a website, and divide it into 12 equal columns. Then you use those lines to align your site content. A grid system can have any number of columns, but 12 is a popular number because it's so flexible. You can have a full width header that spans all 12 columns and then divide the page into halves, thirds, fourths, sixths, and beyond. You see this all over the internet because 12 column grids are flexible and for most sites, they work great. I was really looking for something different, you know, something new, at least new to me. And I started to find compositions and layouts that felt fresh, you know, off center, asymmetrical, unexpected. I was snapping screenshots left and right, and I filled that layout board with incredible references. Then it was on to type. In the past, I've been drawn more towards a traditional feel when it comes to my typography. If the typeface is supposed to represent who I am, then I need to be somewhat of a blend between something more modern and current, but still have that traditional and friendly feeling to it. So I set out to explore. Ooh. Some cool stuff here like that 
diagram, a neo-grotesque with deep joints, or joins. But there's a couple of like typefaces out there that people use with really, really deep inkwells. Um, and that's, that's one thing that I, that just irritates me. There were so many great options to choose from so many incredible foundries, right? I gathered a ton of different typography references and I actually noticed a pattern. I was kind of falling in love with this type of typeface called grotesque. Grotesque fonts are funny. They're gorgeous, but they're also kind of quirky. Their mothers would say that they have a lot of, uh, character. It was a classic. <laughs> Typically, they have very low contrast in both height and weight, but they have really cool characters like double story A's and double story G's. As a class, they typically aren't the most polished, thus the name grotesque, um, but that actually fits my personality pretty well. Uh, however, you probably are familiar with a super smooth neo-grotesque called Helvetica. I downloaded several different trial versions of a few fonts and I started testing them out. I made these simple type specimen layouts that allowed me to see how the type looked at large scale and at small sizes. And one specific typeface stood out, Founders Grotesque. I loved it, I've seen it everywhere, but I honestly have always struggled with, with two things. First, the apertures of the big rounded letters like C and G, they were so tight, they were so close together. I don't know, something about that bugs me. I, I know it's I, I know it's nitpicky, uh, but it matters. You know, stuff like that matters, the details. And second, the cost. All 35 styles of Founders Grotesque, condensed version, the extra condensed version, the text. We need, to, we need to download the text sample or install the text sample. It's $900. I was still in some shock over the cost of Founders Grotesque. But then, I found the one. Whoa. All right, so let me show you. This is the, this is the Founders Grotesque. And I love it. I really do. It's so expensive. So then I found this. What is it? Stelvio Grotesque. Have you guys seen this? at the similarities there it's not as it's not as like it doesn't have as much personality as founders but it's pretty dang close stelvio grotesque is absolutely beautiful it was designed by danilo de marco a creative director and type designer out of italy stelvio stelvio has all the great qualities of a grotesque typeface like that that gorgeous double story g but it's just not extreme like it's a little bit off center, but it's not too far out of the ballpark. And the apertures of the uppercase C and G, they're not too tight, but they're not too open. Stelvio works fantastic as a display typeface like, like you'd use in a heading, and then equally well as body text. It was love at first sight. I love you! Can you put that down? This expresses how loudly I love you! It's too loud. Now remember, picking the, the right typeface is half of the battle, but finding the right way to use it is the other. So I, I started looking for inspirational usages of grotesque typefaces. And as I noticed them, I started saving screenshots of this kind of stuff. Ideas like having huge contrast in the type sizes between the headings and the body type. And then things like combining a smaller all caps heading with larger body paragraphs, all, all this stuff made it onto the board. I now had huge artboards that contained tons of great reference material. By taking a step back and looking at the collections as a whole, it was like I was finally starting to see the puzzle emerge from the pieces. I could see the patterns that I wanted to embrace in the site design, and I started to understand the direction to move towards, and I started getting pretty stoked. I don't know, I just had a, a chance to kind of pause and reflect. And I really think that like, I'm at a good place with the research phase of this whole project. You know, I took a look at my artboards just before I walked out the door and I got some things cooking. You know what I mean? I got some, I got some ideas percolating, percolating, percolating. I don't know. A lot of times during these projects, I get overwhelmed after I do research, but not this time. This time I'm like really inspired. I'm feeling excited and pretty stoked. 
at the at the potential <laughs> of this whole of this whole thing. So, yeah. Now that I'm happy with my reference material and I have a clear direction to pursue, it's time to move into visual design. And at this point, I'm a little nervous. So it's all just kind of hitting me right now, all at once, that not only am I going to be making a series of videos about the thing that I'm making, but I'm also going to be live streaming the entire process. And that's a little terrifying. <laughs> It's just, just, just a tiny bit stressful. You know what? I don't know. It'll be all right. <laughs> oh, you know what's awesome about doing a series like this? Is that you get a chance to reflect on the things that you could do better. And aside from developing a habit of collecting and archiving design inspiration, I think that there was one thing that I should have done. Mix up my sources. I, I wish that times were different and that I could have gone into a library, gotten a few books, or, or took a walk through a flea market, or even gone to a museum. You know, this is the kind of stuff that I'd love to be able to do, the level of research that I, I really feel like uh, I'm missing. You know, you'd be amazed what cool stuff you can find in the real world. Next project, for sure. Next up, I'm going to be designing the website. I'm going to be laying out pages and putting together buttons and dreaming up animations. And hopefully on the other side of this thing, we're going to have something good enough to develop. We'll see. <laughs> Question for you, though. Where do you like to do research? Where do you like to pull inspiration from? Do me a favor and leave those uh, ideas in the comment section below. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull all of the comments together, uh, maybe on a blog article on the new site. And that'll be a, a great resource for all of us to refer to. Remember, I am not here to tell anybody what they should do. I'm here just to share my process, the, the steps that I've taken to get to the end result of this project. Find the way that works for you. Speaking of process, if you missed out on all of the streams over on Twitch this year, you can catch up on every single recording of the entire process, plus get updates about the show and, and more over at thefuture.com forward slash built by hand. Thank you for watching. And remember, go out there and crush it. You got this. Remember, we love you. See you next time.